All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Simon. Thanks, Simon, for the introduction, but also for setting this up. Um, it's it was we had a great discussion earlier today uh, with your team, and I'm hoping that we have the same kind of discussion um, uh, with this webinar. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. What I'm in, hoping to do is um, let's get rid of that. What I'm hoping to do is almost bombard you with uh, information from the scientific community on what talent means. Um, some areas that we've identified where our knowledge is uh, surprisingly limited, where there are maybe some opportunities for sports, uh, sporting organizations, policymakers, coaches to take advantage of uh, the current situation. And um, basically to provide a platform Form for discussion because um, I'm sure Simon would agree the the best part of what we got out of the session earlier today was the uh, the specific questions that came from practitioners and and coaches uh, who had specific areas that they were uh, interested in and so the more that we could gear the direction towards um, that kind of discussion after the presentation the better and so. Um, I really see the presentation as a platform for that uh, discussion. And so, like Simon said, I really encourage you to get those questions into the chat box so we can, uh, we can have that rich discussion after the fact. My goal is um, to provide that platform for the discussion. And my research group uh, for at least the last 20 years has been focused on trying to understand the factors that affect athlete development, how we create better environments for their training, uh, how we can use evidence-based approaches to inform policy and, uh, and practitioner um, uh, design of uh, training environments. Um, one of the things that we've realized though in, in that 20 plus year journey is that the scientist is only one voice in the room and that's important to acknowledge at the beginning and, and um, I'm going to present the information from the scientific community um, but I recognize that science is often slow to figure out what coaches have figured out already and um, if there's things that I talk about that don't resonate with you or that are counter to your own experience that's the kind of thing that i want to see in the in the chat uh, discussion um, we can both get to a better place if you uh, don't agree with everything that i say i think um, i'm here to be challenged i'm here to to get pushback on ideas um, because when we do that we both get to stronger places and so um, i'm hoping that that's where the discussion ends um, or or at least uh, continues and um, yeah that's kind of what i'm here for i'm not otherwise we could just do a a one hour webinar on youtube without any engagement the engagement is kind of the point so um, don't be afraid to give me any of your challenging questions uh, worst case scenario i'll say i don't know the answer but let me look into it uh, best case scenario we can have a rich discussion and get to some place uh, stronger so with that um, when simon and i were talking about the topic for today uh, a, a lot of this comes from a, a discussion that I gave for the English Institute of Sport in February at a, a session that they did uh, in the UK that was focused on understanding talent selection with the goal of helping people involved in that process, whether you're a policymaker, a coach, a scout, or a, um, an athlete, on how we can make better decisions about uh, the way that we manage talent, the way that we try to identify and select for it. Um, in principle, this should be a simple process. Uh, if talent is normally distributed across the population, then I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be. Um, and if we have good indicators for measuring it or identifying it, then our process is simple. We choose the people on the far right hand side of a uh, normal distribution in our measure of interest and we select those people to move on. Um, we, this is the process of selection across the athlete development pathway. The number of selection steps would vary by sport. The time at which the selection occurs might vary by sport, but the process is essentially the same. It assumes two things. One, that talent is normally distributed and maybe more importantly, it assumes that we have good indicators of measuring it. Um, both of these things are important, 
um, foundational components of the talent identification and selection system. I want to talk a little bit about um, why these selection stages are important and why um, understanding the, the, the role of selection and the impact of selection at different phases in the athlete pathway are important. And the best evidence that I have, uh, or the best data that I have comes from uh, basketball in the United States. So at any, uh, any point in time in the US, there's, between, there's about 3.6 million male youth basketball players. Um, if we want to understand the pathway towards playing in the NBA, we need to understand the selection steps that occur either implicitly uh, by the way that the system is structured or explicitly by the way that coaches make their selections. So in one selection step, if you want to go to the NBA, you always have to play high school basketball. And in one selection step, uh, we go from 3.6 million youth to uh, just over half a million youth uh, because there's only 18,000 high school basketball programs in the U.S. And so um, a selection step occurs that makes a very powerful impact on the resource pool for that sport. We go from uh, 3.6 million youth to about a sixth of uh, that size in a single selection step. If you want to continue in the system, uh, you almost always have to go to a Division I college program. Uh, in the United States, uh, there's about 19,000 uh, college or, or high-level Division I, Division II um, uh, high school players. So in two selection steps, now we've gone from 3.6 million to uh, 540,000, now down to 19,000 players um, in our system. Of those players, the NBA has a two-round draft system, which selects about 60 players. Of those 60, about 50 go on to play uh, even a single game at the NBA uh, level. And what's important here is understanding the power of those selection steps on our, maybe our most important resource, which is uh, people, talent uh, entering the system. Now, we spend a lot of time in sports science and, and um, uh, practitioner energy focusing on this group, uh, the elite performers, but the real cost to our system is occurring early. Uh, and we, we don't really pay much attention to the selection um, uh, and the impact of selection that occurs here, which is not a problem uh, if our selections are accurate. Uh, that's the big question. What's the accuracy of the selections? How do we know that we've chosen the right half a million players to, to make it into the high school level? This is an important question because um, sports have become or have made it increasingly difficult for players who are deselected from the system to re-engage with that system later on. And so if you're the, the player who's cut from his high school basketball team, um, the likelihood of you re-engaging in that system to emerge as a, a strong college player is very, very low. What are the what are the what do the odds look like? Um, I calculated these uh, a couple of weeks ago just for fun. Um, the odds of a pre-high school player in the United States making it to the NBA is about one in seventy thousand. Um, so what's that number mean? Well, an actor in Hollywood has three times greater likelihood of winning an Academy Award than a pre-high school player has of making it to the NBA. Uh, golfers have two times greater chance of being sent to the emergency room in a golf cart accident than a pre-high school player has of making it to the NBA. So the odds here are very, very long, which is not a problem if we know we're choosing the right single person out of that 70,000 to make it to the MBA level. Unfortunately, the evidence that we have is that the accuracy of our selections is not very good. Um, this is a study that we did of the professional sports drafts a few years ago, where we looked at simply the accuracy of um, the, 
the draft selection on predicting future performance. And we looked at a really simple relationship between the round that you're drafted in, which is uh, a supposedly a measure of your potential, players who are drafted earlier have more potential than players who are drafted later, and the ultimate number of games you played at the professional level. Uh, we did entertain the idea of looking at performance indicators, but uh, teams have different ways that they use players. Uh, and so a way of determining whether you had value to your team is looking at whether you played games. Uh, and so games played became a better measure of uh, individual players' value to that team. And if we just look at the round that a player is drafted in and their uh, games played at the professional level, the results were, for us at least, surprisingly poor, at least from a statistical standpoint. Uh, Major League Baseball, which um, has a, a, a massive draft, 40 plus rounds uh, in their draft, accounted for about 3% of the variance in games played, which is maybe not a surprise because uh, Major League Baseball has a separate development system, uh, a separate farm system uh, that they use for developing players. And so they, they massively oversample. Uh, in their draft. The NBA had the best, uh, which is 17% uh, of the variance in games played, um, which is, again, not a surprise because they have a two-round system, which kind of controls the amount of variation between performers. Uh, only the best performers ever get selected in the draft. And so um, these relationships made sense to us, at least when you look at the types of players that are selected. But the overall accuracy for us, at least from a statistics standpoint, seemed low. Um, low for a couple of reasons. One is professional sports in North America spend tens of millions of dollars a year trying to identify who are the best selection choices. Uh, and what these accuracy values suggest to us is that if this was a problem that could be solved just by throwing money at it, um, professional sports would have solved it. And the fact that this is the level of accuracy that they see means that this is not a money problem. This is, a, uh, this is probably a, a limitation either in the way we approach this selection exercise or the fact that this is too complex an outcome to predict with any level of accuracy. The other point I think that's really important here is these uh, selections are being done at an adult level. These are um, players that are exiting high school or exiting the college level. Uh, and if we wait until that long in development to make a decision about their likelihood of success, this is the level of accuracy that we get. I don't see any evidence to suggest that as we back the clock up to now looking at pre-adolescence or even early adolescence, or maybe even in childhood for some sports, that we would have anything close to accurate decisions um, uh, in terms of these selections. A second study that we did on this, uh, and it's uh, these prospective kinds of studies are surprisingly limited in, in sports science, and we'll get into that in a moment. Um, a second study we did looked at a longitudinal database that we had from German handball. My colleague here, Jörg Schor, um, had access to this database because of his uh, involvement with that system. Uh, and it was a beautiful data set because uh, he was involved in the initial evaluation of adolescent players. Uh, this was a sample of female handball players in Germany that were assessed at the age of 13 and 14 as part of a regional selection camp. Uh, and we could go back now uh, looking at those uh, evaluations done in 2001 and look at how accurate they were at predicting where those athletes and players uh, eventually ended up. 10 years later, 14 of the 58 original players in 2001 were members of the national squad or the national team uh, uh, level. So how well did the um, coaches' selections in 2001 when the players were 13 and 14 predict where they would end it up? We need to have a baseline level of probability to compare the coaches against. And so uh, apologies, this is going to get a little statistical uh, for a moment. If we just said that everyone in that sample was not talented because being untalented or not having talent is much more frequent than being talented, we would have a probability of 76%. Uh, so 76% accuracy uh, 
uh, in terms of that that sample. When we so that's our baseline that we can compare coaches and um, uh, regional and national coaches to. If we compare those coaches to that baseline probability, we see that the accuracy uh, ranged a little bit. Uh, the national coaches were the best at 79%. Regional level coaches were um, 75%. Um, in general, coaches were better than uh, the, the a priori probability at identifying uh, or making those selections on the players. Uh, an important distinction for us is um, they had similar rates of what are called type one and type two errors. Type one is your false positive. So thinking that a player has talent when they don't. Uh, type two is a false negative where you think that they don't have talent when in fact they do. Coaches were very similar in their rates of, um, uh, of type one and type two errors. What made this study unique was um, another element where we were interested in looking at how capable is the average person on the street of, of identifying talent. So how easy is it to uh, identify talent in, um, uh, in high performance sport? So we stopped random people on the streets in a university town in Germany and we just said, watch this short video of, of scrimmage or, or playing time uh, and tell me whether you think the player is talented or not. The average person on the street in Germany has a seven, has an accuracy rate of 73%, um, which is a bit surprising. But the more important element of this comparison, I think, is the fact that they were more likely to make type 2 errors, which means they were more likely to think talent wasn't there when, in fact, it ended up being there. Um, which, if we think about a coach's primary job, um, their primary job in sport, which is uh, highly resource limited, uh, is to make sure talent doesn't leave the system. Um, because once talent leaves the system, as I mentioned earlier, it's really difficult for it to re-engage. And so coaches should be erroring on the side of type one errors when at all possible. And we'll get into uh, maybe a bit of discussion about, you know, it's easy to say that, but uh, in a resource limited system, um, you know, we're limited in terms of how many spots we can we can actually uh, give to players. So how do we how do we correct for that? How do we how do we uh, design a better system for uh, making more type one errors as opposed to type two? So unfortunately, the evidence suggests that we're poor predictors of um, talent selection. Uh, we'll get into some factors uh, now about why that occurs, but the problem with a lot of the scientific evidence in this area is that um, we don't have a lot of it. Those two studies were done by our research lab. There's been a handful of other long-term uh, prognostic um, uh, designs, but in general, there are a handful of studies in a massive um, field of scientific evidence that are uh, inconsistent, um, they're hard to compare across each other. Uh, so we need to have a lot more attention to this kind of evaluation of decisions over time. What evidence we do have though suggests that the factors uh, that affect the efficacy or the accuracy of our selection decisions, first and foremost, is that we have an incomplete understanding of what talent is. Part of this is um, the scientific community. There's a limited evidence base for the dis discussions of talent. We haven't pushed and prodded and, and stretched this concept enough as we have with other things. Uh, and so um, we're not really sure what talent means. So we have 100 plus people uh, on the webinar today. If I was to say, write down your definition of talent, we would end up with a very diverse, a highly variable definition of what this thing is. That's the reality of talent in sport, but it makes it really tough to do research on something if we don't have a strong operational definition. The other thing that's important is to recognize that even though talent is part of the, the language and the vernacular that we use in sport, it's part of policy documents, either implicitly or explicitly, um, it's a new concept for us in terms of uh, in terms of science. So here is a figure showing the number of peer-reviewed articles in sports science journals uh, between 1976 and 2018. 
Uh, and you can see that we're on a massive upward trajectory in terms of interest in this concept. So what this means is not only is this a new area for scientists, but if coaches and practitioners are, are hoping that the scientific community can provide them with conclusive answers about what talent is and how it can be managed, we don't have those answers because this is a new thing for us. Um, we don't have the gold standard evidence that's needed in order to really understand the implications of this concept. So we've, uh, as part of my uh, research group, um, we've tried to explore what we can actually say, what we can actually use as solid evidence to help practitioners in their desire for evidence to base models and policies on. This is a, a systematic review that my uh, current PhD student, uh, Katie Johnson, did uh, a few years ago that looked at um, a massive research evidence base on talent research in sport. So a systematic review as a, a process of summarizing and, and collating uh, evidence in a given subject area. And so uh, Katie, in, in her uh, research, did a search of uh, talent, expertise, giftedness uh, in sports settings, um, in large, uh, massive uh, scientific um, uh, literature bases for a 25 year period. As you'd expect because of that last figure with that massive upward trajectory, there were a lot of articles uh, in this area, uh, almost 1500. But in this systematic review, we were interested in looking at just the high quality evidence. So skilled uh, samples being compared to less skilled samples. Uh, longitudinal designs to be able to show that the differences between skilled and lesser skilled groups actually tracked over time. And the, the reasons for those uh, skill differences were the variables that were being examined. Um, we wanted it to be published in a peer-reviewed journal and rightly or wrongly when scientific evidence is put out for peer review it does get a stamp of approval from the scientific community to say yeah you guys did your job right uh, and so that's not to say that all evidence needs to be peer-reviewed but there is a sort of standard of quality for peer-reviewed evidence that suggests that um, it's past the qual the sniff test. It's past the quality control test. When we institute just those three um, criteria for increasing the quality of the evidence, we go from nearly fifteen hundred studies to twenty. That's twenty studies, not in football, not in ice hockey. Twenty studies across the whole domain of sports science. Um, so if you're looking for evidence to build evidence-based policies on, that evidence doesn't exist. Um, so on the one hand, this is a somewhat depressing statistic. Uh, we thought certainly it's going to be higher than this. Um, but it also presents opportunities uh, for those working in sport, because if you're assuming that the answer is out there and that other countries or other teams or other sports have that answer and they're just not sharing it, it's nobody has the answer. That answer isn't out there. So there are opportunities there for people to, um, to challenge the established traditions of their sport, the, the, the traditions of athlete development, the traditions of talent selection. Most of the studies in that systematic review that Katie did focused on physical and anthropometric outcomes, which is not a surprise. These are very objective, very reliably measured across uh, contexts, um, but they only tell part of the problem or part of the, part of the uh, profile. Um, we have very few studies that have looked at psychological, cognitive or perceptual variables um, in talent research. Most of the studies focused on soccer or rugby uh, in the UK, almost all from the last 10 years. Like I mentioned, very few deal with the accuracy of these decisions over longer periods of time. Um, a second review that we're currently um, doing at the moment was trying to understand the overall profile of evidence for um, the field of talent science. So in this one, we, were, we did what's called the scoping review to provide a more descriptive profile of where researchers have spent their time uh, since 1990. So um, 
yeah, almost uh, 30 years of data. Uh, here, greater than 3,000 different studies. Here, we were interested in uh, looking at demographic information like the age of the participants, the gender, what countries were examined, what sports were examined, what skill levels, because uh, mo as most of you know, working with your sport, there are sport specific, um, gender specific, age specific nuances to the messaging that we give about talent um, and athlete development that need to be recognized. And so uh, in an effort to do this, we were interested in looking at, well, how much evidence is there out there on female only uh, research or on Irish um, specific uh, development because as we or as I learned this morning the constraints that uh, Northern Ireland faces in terms of athlete development are fundamentally different than almost every other country in the world and so we can't just take a model from from uh, England or from Canada or from Australia and impose that model on the Irish the Northern Irish system because it doesn't work that way um, there's more effective way to do that. And so part of this exercise was just seeing, well, where do we actually have a reasonable amount of evidence that we're confident could be used to develop evidence-based policy? Another element that we looked at here was the quality. Uh, in here, it was uh, essentially very simple. What was the design of the study? What was the sample size? As very crude kind of measures of the quality of evidence. And then uh, a part that I won't get into today, we are also looking at the focus of the research. So here's some very, very preliminary data um, from a preliminary analysis we did a, a, a few weeks ago. Um, as you can see, no surprise here, the amount of uh, male versus female specific evidence uh, is, is quite, quite striking. Um, the, the, the green uh, uh, pie slice that you see here is mixed sample research and I'm sure um, the designing a, a study based on a mixture of males and females is probably not the optimal approach either but if we want to have female based um, evidence we don't have much of it is, uh, is what this um, profile suggests to us. Similarly if we look at where the sampling is being done, we see almost nothing from childhood samples, despite the evidence that selections are being done in childhood. Uh, youth, we have a little bit more, but still surprisingly sparse compared to the number of selections that are being done during this time frame. And go back to that diagram I had about the NBA selection and the costs that are being done in early selections throughout the system. Now couple that with the very limited evidence that we have on research in these uh, age groups and you see the start of, a, of what could be considered a massive problem in the way that we design and, and measure talent. In terms of countries, uh, it would have been nice to be able to split the UK into its component parts, but most of the time researchers just haven't done that. Uh, and so we, for just the sake of uh, simplicity, we grouped them all together. I apologize for that in advance. If anybody would like to see Irish specific uh, examples, we have that data set. You can shoot me an email. I'd be happy to share anything that was uh, um, Irish or Northern Irish um, specific. So, uh, but for the most part, researchers just kind of group them together and call them the United Kingdom, which is, uh, again, knowing the system a little better than I, than I did um, is probably a limitation in the way that um, the evidence for uh, at least to inform the Northern Ireland uh, uh, approach to talent development um, could probably be corrected. In terms of sports, what we see is soccer is the king or football um, is the king here. Um, everything else is a very distant uh, second to the research emphasis on uh, football and soccer. Uh, which is not a surprise to us, but um, it does inform this conclusion that, yeah, we might be able to make evidence-based policies for football or for soccer, but we, we would have a, a, harder, uh, a harder challenge to, um, uh, to make if we wanted to make that with almost any other sport. And here's just our simple measure of um, the quality of the evidence. That big blue slice of the pie is cross-sectional research. 
which uh, in and of itself doesn't necessarily indicate poor research design, but for a concept like talent, which is inherently time-based, um, we don't know that the indicator that you're measuring today and calling uh, talent selection is actually a good indicator for long-term um, uh, accuracy. Um, it's a bit of a problem for a concept like talent. Um, Cross-sectional data is not an optimal way to look at talent. We need longitudinal, we need tracking-based studies in order to, um, in order to um, test the viability and efficacy of those variables. What this means, though, is that our knowledge of talent identification, selection, and development is pretty limited. It's largely restricted to males uh, using small samples with cross-sectional designs um, and largely from football. Uh, so if we want to make any kind of conclusions outside of those uh, basic groups, we would have a problem doing so based on the limitations and the evidence base. So when I say that we have an incomplete understanding of what talent is, um, it's massively incomplete. The problem with that is the evidence, but another problem is that talent isn't just a single thing. As I mentioned uh, in Katie's systematic review, there was a greater proportion of research on physical and physiological outcomes because of their simplicity to measure, but also because of their research traditions. Physiology has led the way in a lot of this sports science. Um, there's been very little attention and focus to uh, mental and psychological factors or cognitive and perceptual factors that are relevant for talent selection. Uh, and so there's opportunities here if we start to look at talent not as a single thing, but as a uh, complex web of these different factors that interact with each other uh, over time. So one of the things that we've tried to do because of this vague uh, definition that exists between talent is we've tried to come up with a way to operationalize it and situate it in athlete development models to try to test whether it has any value. Um, part of this is um, just a simple way to design it uh, and, and, and put it into research studies so that we can test whether it has any utility for coaches uh, and, and practitioners. Um, if we could draw a line through it, I think part of the discussions that we have about athlete development would improve even if we could just show uh, that it's not relevant. Um, we can't do that yet because the designs have been vague, the designs have been, um, uh, have been confounded in the way that they situate talent. It's hard to tell what's talent and what's experience, what's talent and what's skill, uh, for instance. When, we, when we've situated talent as the starting point in that journey, it's what you're born with, it's innate, um, and everything else after that is an interaction between talent and experience, then we've set it up as a different kind of variable than, uh, than other research has. The problematic part for us in terms of measurement is though um, we look at this as if this is a linear process, but the interaction between what you start with and what you end with uh, is complicated by a talent by experience interaction. And the greater degree that your key performance variables uh, interact with your environment, uh, the more convoluted and difficult this process is. So in simple contexts where the talent by environment interaction on your key performance indicators is small, like in sports like rowing, diving, gymnastics, where a performance to a larger extent is uh, determined by height and body stature, then prediction is better. It's not perfect, but it's better than it is in more complex domains like football, where yes, size is important, but you can overcome limitations in size by being a more technical player or making better decisions or reading the play better than your, than your peers. Uh, in those environments where the pathway to expertise is more variable, predictions are often very poor, which is why we see the lower levels of prediction in our um, professional sports draft data is because uh, the predictions aren't as linear, or aren't as clean as they are in other sports. We also know that 
the talent by experience interaction is affected throughout the pathway, especially in the pre-adolescent period by growth and maturation. Uh, if you're faster in terms of your growth, uh, you're gonna get different experiences than someone who's a late bloomer. Same thing with learning. If you uh, learn faster uh, in the initial phases of development, the feedback that you receive, the opportunities for development that you get are better than somebody who's a late bloomer. And so these things will affect the talent by experience interaction. And ultimately coaches have to make decisions. It's fine to say, yeah, uh, there's a talent by experience interaction. And so we shouldn't make selections until as late as possible in the pathway. Um, if we don't provide resources to coaches to be able to uh, keep people for longer, then we still have a system that necessitates uh, coaches making those decisions at maybe points when uh, it's not accurate to do so. And so ultimately, our discussion today is going to be about how do we make more efficient and effective decisions with the limited resources that we have. One of the ways we can do that um, is by developing performance benchmarks. For, uh, for understanding the implications of an athlete's current level of performance, because those benchmarks help us understand what that performance means over the athlete pathway. When we don't have those benchmarks, we're left with peer comparisons. And peer comparisons we know are um, uh, can be biased in terms of uh, this growth, maturation, and learning effects. Uh, they perpetuate things like relative age effects. Uh, and so if we can, we try to remove peer comparisons and look at each athlete as an individual relative to a performance benchmark. The other limitation that we have, and this goes back to the scientific evidence, is um, we're trying to understand the pathway towards peak performance. And as we uh, mentioned in that figure a couple slides ago, the majority of the evidence that we have about peak performance over time is cross-sectional. Um, if we look at performance of uh, players in, in terms of the research evidence across different phases of development at different age groups, most of the time the evidence is focusing on the best. Who are the best performers at U11 or U9 or U13? Um, the, it's easy to make the assumption that the players who were the best at U13 end up being the best at the adult level. Um, most of the research on conversion rates of who was on junior national teams or who went to junior world championships, the conversion rates from those junior teams to senior teams is surprisingly uh, poor compared to what we might expect. And I think part of the reason is we have this expectation that the best performer is always at the top of their uh, cohort, their peer cohort. What we need are greater variabilities in terms of um, data in the system. We need to actually know who was the worst in a, a peer group because essentially what we need to know is the trajectory of athlete development. Did the person who ended up on the uh, Olympic team have a developmental profile that looked like this, where they were always performing at the top of their cohort, uh, or did it look like this? Was it a gradual improvement in progression over time, sustained feelings of competence, sustained intrinsic motivation that just bore out the, the test of, of time? Uh, or was it like this, some inconsistent, unpredictable pattern of development? Uh, where sometimes they were poor, sometimes they were good, um, which profile maps on to the trajectory of long-term athlete performance? We don't really know this, uh, the answer to this question right now, and it might be why our prediction models are so, uh, so poor. So what's the power of the benchmark? So these are some uh, benchmark data from uh, Dutch speed skating and, and swimming. Um, and I, you can see the, the reference to the paper here. If you're interested in getting a copy, shoot me an email. I'm happy to send it to you. But for our discussion, I think what's important is when we have an athlete's performance at uh, 15 years old or 
uh, or 12 years old, we can now place them on this benchmarking profile and say, you're either within or outside that window of, um, of uh, elite performance that we see over time. If you're outside the window, then that doesn't necessarily mean you can't turn into an exceptional performer. But when we have a resource limited system, you're not as good a bet as somebody who's within that window. The other critical thing here is we often focus on the mean value and the, and the, the area above the curve without really focusing on the fact that there's this area under the curve that's as least as important. Put a different way, how bad could you be as a performer at age 13 or 15 and still end up on the national team or on the Olympic podium five years, 10 years later? We very rarely ask that question. Our questions are always, how good do you need to be? Not how bad could you be? Um, it just changes the discussion a little bit. And that's why these benchmarking, uh, these benchmarking exercises can be so valuable. So that's our incomplete understanding. Of, so there's room for improvement here. There's room, there's opportunities for uh, improvement in the system overall. Another area that affects the efficacy of talent selection are biases that are interfering with the process of identification and selection. So um, here we see every element of the system has a degree of bias associated with it. Scouts, coaches, um, this is the Cognitive Bias Codex, which is a, a collection of information processing biases that our brains uh, in general have for how we compute things like risk, how we compute um, uh, answers to decision-making problems. We're fairly certain that coaches and scouts suffer from the same kinds of information processing bias biases that may and maybe some that are particularly relevant to them. The availability heuristic, for example, is a information processing bias that we have where we, um, when we're in a situation and we have to make a decision, we use information that is most recent in our memory. So a coach making a decision about a player, uh, whether they're talented or not, if they just had a player who looked like one player versus another player, they're more likely to choose the athlete um, who looks like the one who was previously successful. That's basic cognitive biases. Um, do these things exist in coach and scout settings? Uh, one of my PhD students, Katie Johnston, is uh, exploring this in her PhD. We're pretty certain that these biases exist. One of the reasons we're certain is because of the relative age effect. Right? This is uh, just a simple profile of players drafted to play in the National Hockey League. Um, any sport that has a large participation base where early selections are made in pre-adolescence, we see this profile. Uh, rugby rugby uh, league in the UK has one of the worst relative age profiles that we've ever seen. This isn't a surprise to most coaches and, and, and um, stakeholders in high performance sport, but what's surprising is the fact that we've known about this effect for going on nearly 30 years and it hasn't decreased uh, during that time. So um, it suggests that this bias is persistent, it's hard to get rid of, uh, and, it's, and it's still relevant. There are also biases in the way that the system is designed. So these are inaccuracies uh, in the way that we make selection decisions. So if we agree that talent is normally distributed over a population, then it doesn't make sense that um, high performance sports systems would oversample players and families with high socioeconomic status. Or um, in Canada, we have this birthplace uh, bias where there's a greater proportion of athletes who come from you know, smaller urban centers as opposed to large urban centers or small rural communities. That doesn't make sense if talent is normally distributed. It means that there's an inaccuracy in the selection system. There are also uh, evidences of inefficiencies in that system. In the way that we develop athletes, for example, uh, the dominance of left-handers we find is a great example of an inefficient system for athlete development. 
in the normal population, there are about 10% left-handed individuals. But in interactive sports like tennis, tennis at one point relatively recently had 35% left-handers. That means that there's something not occurring properly in development that allows left-handers to dominate over right-handers. We know that this uh, has everything to do with exposure because righties uh, see right-handed players 90% of the time and only 10% of the time see left-handers. If you give them a training intervention so that they see more lefties, the effect goes away. So we know that this is development uh, and an inefficiency in development as opposed to being something neuroanatomical or something innate. And then finally, we have athlete biases. Sport is pretty, um, pretty rampant with stereotypes about performance. Performance needs to look a certain way. It needs to look a certain size. It needs to look a certain color. Um, these stereotypes that we have about size or ethnicity or race, um, in the absence of any kind of conclusive evidence, still provide advantages or disadvantages to the people who are on different sides of that stereotype. If, you're, uh, if you reflect the stereotype, you get what's called a boost uh, in your performance. Your confidence goes up. Uh, if you're on the disadvantage, if you're against that stereotype, you experience a threat. Performance goes down because of uh, anxiety, stress response, uh, in how it affects working memory. Uh, there's a number of mechanisms that, that are implicated here. And mindset is another one uh, that's emerged through Carol Dweck's work. Um, some of the more recent meta-analyses and systematic reviews are suggesting that the effect isn't quite as strong as it was sold uh, to be initially, but it's still uh, an important effect on athletes' approaches to their training uh, and their own learning. So these biases are interfering with the identification and selection process. We need to remember that um, the athlete is also a really important variable in determining selection. You know, I think oftentimes we focus on the explicit selections that coaches are making, but athletes are also choosing to stay involved or stay engaged in their sports. And that's a, an implicit selection that they're making that could be affected by some of these other biases. So now that we've kind of laid this uh, doom and gloom profile of what the science tells us about selection and identification, um, I always like to, to ensure that people understand that, yeah, this is a problem if you're waiting for the scientific community to give you an answer. Uh, those answers don't exist, uh, at least as far as we're aware of. Uh, and so now it becomes an opportunity. What's the opportunity that you could take advantage of now knowing that, hey, there isn't somebody on the other side of the planet who has the answer to this question. So what I like to do normally with talking with coaching groups and practitioner groups is to get them to think about now that you know that you're probably worse than you think at making selection decisions, what would you change if you could? How would you change the way that you uh, do this process? Because all of, we can't just give you 50% more resources in your system, but we can change the way that you approach this whole, um, th this whole scenario. So now assuming that you are poor at making these decisions, how would you change things uh, relative to your past experience where you probably thought you were making good decisions? I think that's a really important question for coaches and practitioners to be thinking about. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna uh, frame some areas where in our discussion with practitioners and sports organizations around the world, um, have suggested some rooms for improvement. One is recognizing the gaps in our knowledge and the limitations of the current way that we do things. And here we like to set up a simple comparison between the way that we typically think about athletic potential, which is as a binary, you either have it or you don't, um, and compare that to the way that we think about weather because weather forecasting um, has been probably the, as much as we uh, disparage the weather man, um, weather forecasting has probably been the best example of um, predictive modeling that we've seen in science over the last hundred years. 
Um, and so if we can take the lessons that we've learned from weather forecasting and apply them to athletic potential, would we design the system in a different way? So for example, if I was to say, you know, what do you think the weather's gonna be like this time next year? You'd probably look at your weather app or you'd look at your window and you'd say, well, it's probably gonna be very similar to the way it is now. And in between now and then you would update your prediction. You would wait for new information. You might look at um, broad general patterns of weather information suggesting that you know spring is gonna be either colder next year or warmer next year. You would update your, uh, your estimate or your forecast as the day a year from now approaches. And then up to probably the hour, or the minute of which I asked you to make that forecast, you'd still be refining your model as new information emerges. That's a way we need to think about athletic potential, but it's not how we think about it now. The problem with how we think about athletic potential now is once an athlete is selected, we fundamentally change the trajectory for that athlete relative to everyone else in their peer group, right? So think about the athlete who's just been told, you know what, I don't think you're not gonna make the team this year. Well, you've just given them negative feedback about their competence. You probably undermined their intrinsic motivation. You've told them that they don't have talent, which they might see depending on their mindset as either fixed or something that they can learn. Um, but what you've done is fundamentally different than what you've done to that athlete who you just told is talented. And so now um, they can never be compared again because they're essentially apples and oranges, which means the evaluation of those decisions, even in those prospective studies that I mentioned earlier, the evaluation of those decisions is extremely, extremely difficult, if not impossible. I'm not aware of a single sporting environment in the world where we make selections or uh, estimates of potential, but then don't change the system for the athlete, keep them involved. That's why forecasts of athletic potential are different than weather. Weather stays, the, the variables in the model stay constant. They can be continually updated because we haven't fundamentally changed different groups of uh, items in the model, which we do with athlete development. So our long-term evaluation of uh, decision-making accuracy, uh, accuracy is probably even worse than we think. We also need to fully understand the implications and risks associated with the process. So most of the time we think about talent as a yes or no decision, but practitioners and, and coaches know that it's not, it's not binary. There's a lot of people in the maybe group that uh, are the ones that give us greatest concern. Um, the no's are easy to identify, the yeses are easy to identify, but the maybes are the ones that we struggle with. And so how do we improve that decision-making process? One of the ways that we've done it is to challenge coaches to recognize that not all selection decisions have the same level of risk. So I'm gonna go over this really quickly. If you uh, want more information, I'm happy to send it. This is a simple decision-making grid that we've developed as a tool for coaches and scouts uh, to think about talent differently. And it's a simple exercise where for every athlete that you have to make a decision on, uh, you place them on this grid. And it recognizes that there are different levels of risk to where people fall on the grid. Boxes one and nine are not really uh, much risk because a low performer with low potential will, will be removed from the system. A high performer with high potential will be maintained by the system. But almost every other box in the system has a degree of risk associated to it. The medium risk are the yellow here because average performance is probably not going to succeed in an elite system. So they might clog resources that are better suited to others. The red boxes are, are high risk because um, box number three here, the person who has current high performance but low potential is gonna talk, take a space from someone who is more deserving. The uh, box seven and eight where the person is at low or uh, medium current performance is at risk of being removed from the system even though they have the highest potential. 
it's important to recognize that we don't know where any athlete is on this grid, but when we have coaches and practitioners come in and talk about, you know, why did you see them as a five when I rated them as a seven, you create a different kind of decision-making process that helps us to accommodate some of the risks, some of the bias uh, that we've identified in the process when we just allow a coach to make that decision. The last thing is to plot a path to improvement. And so, of course, as a scientist, I'm going to say we need better research with uh, better longitudinal tracking, evaluations of long-term accuracy, stronger links between research experts and practitioners. And I think there are a number of countries that do this really well. But there, it's important for coaches and practitioners to know that there are researchers out there that would love to be doing work with them. Uh, and to not be hesitant to reach out and get in touch, uh, either through social media, or through your local university or, or, or whatever. Um, there are groups that would just love to be involved with teams doing uh, work on the field. How do we create a better development system? Well, one, I think that's particularly important with Sport Northern Ireland, but also many countries around the world is to figure out a better way to use resources. So better modeling, uh, and, and measurement, focusing on variables that aren't just the physical and the physiological, what psychological factors predict long-term development, what perceptual factors uh, predict long-term talent. We're starting to look at these things uh, in greater detail now because uh, basically to try to get a performance advantage. If the rest of the world is focusing on physical and physiological, well, the advantage comes from looking somewhere else. And so that's what we've tried to emphasize for sporting organizations is don't look where everyone else is looking look somewhere else that's where you get your competitive advantage we can also design a better uh, and more efficient way of managing the system and uh, i know in our discussion earlier on uh, today with uh, sport northern ireland it, it seemed like a great system for integrating what are often seen as separate pillars I know in Canada, these things are seen as, as very separate and any kind of connection between them is, is loose and, and, and more, um, uh, more implicit. We think about the uh, high performance athlete system as being athlete centered without recognizing that in order to manage these systems efficiently, we need to be training our coaches and developing cutting edge uh, relevant research at the same time that we're feeding those resources into the athlete support system. And when we treat them like silos, we have a system that's not as efficient and targeted as it could be. The other thing that I would recommend is, um, and this comes out of discussions that we've had with a number of sports in Canada, is to just, because there's no evidence out there to support a single system for capturing all of the nuances and complexities of, of athlete development and talent selection is the Game of Thrones approach to talent selection and break the wheel. Why feel the need to force fit a model like LTAD uh, or, or your current um, sport model to, to your individual context? Um, why not design a, an approach that captures the nuances of your own sports system uh, and recognizes the fact that these things are, are complex and that approaches to the identification and selection need to be uh, unique. So an example of this, uh, if we go back to that discussion about uh, participation and the greatest costs in the system, is what would happen if we didn't make those selection costs early on? Most of the time, the system is built in with an assumption that if we don't make those selection costs uh, or those selections early on, we're going to lose the athletes from the system. We need those broad numbers selected early on to feed forward into the future high performance development system. It wasn't until relatively recently that we've tried to challenge that whole assumption. Um, and it brought me back to a exercise that I was involved in in 2013 with the rugby football union in the UK. We, we did a talk on early specialization and early development strategies for the RFU. And it was one of those times when every scientist and practitioner in the room kind of agreed. We all patted each other on the back and concluded that 
the RFU should delay measurement and selection until as late as possible, preferably into the late adolescent period. And almost in the same sentence, we said, well, that'll never work because the rugby union players that don't get selected early on are going to get selected by rugby league or by football or by some other sport. And by the time we get to the post-adolescent period, all the great rugby union players will be gone. That didn't happen. And uh, by most accounts of people in the RFU that I talked to, this, this position statement has been a big success. Rugby union players didn't go and find other sports because rugby union players are especially suited for rugby union. Uh, and they will find that sport because what we think of as a fundamental motive of human behavior, the drive for competence. Competence feedback for rugby union players will come from playing rugby union, not from playing league or not from playing football. And so if we give athletes more opportunities and exposure to more different types of sports, will they find their best suited sport themselves instead of assuming that we need the system to do that for them? Uh, that's what I mean by the break the wheel approach. Are there different ways that we could be feeding our system that go against the tradition and the policies that are sometimes imposed on us by our national uh, governing structures? So just to sum up and hopefully get to some rich discussion, um, I think there are opportunities here, but they require a different approach than the one that we're taking currently, at least in most contexts. I think there are examples of contexts where um, sports are taking advantage of these things, they're not fe feeling married to the traditional approach, and I think we're seeing advancement as a result of that. We also need evaluations of system effectiveness. Part of this is a warts and all approach. We need to know how bad our system is in order to be able to plot improvement. Right now, um, has, uh, policymakers and governments are hesitant to measure system effectiveness, I think because they don't want the answer. Uh, I think they see them th that they'll be put at risk if they uh, if they demonstrate how poor they are at, at these kinds of things. Remember, we have a whole sports system that's based on the idea that early talent selection is necessary and important. What if we were to find out that it's not? Um, most systems don't want to have to deal with that. And then finally, 20 years of research, even this more recent research focusing on talent and selection, still brings me back to this conclusion that if we really want to uh, if we really want to develop and accentuate athlete development regardless of we're talking about talent selection or just athlete development in general it's about focusing on opportunities and increasing the quality of training practice across the pathway because when we look at all the variables that affect long-term achievement this is where the greatest impact is so with that, I'll, um, I'll end the, dis the presentation, hopefully open it up for some good questions. Um, I'd just like to point out that my research lab in, in Toronto, we're trying to position ourselves as, um, as the link between the practitioner and the scientific community. And, and one of the things we found is that oftentimes the scientists are putting out this cutting edge research. The practitioners don't get access to it because it's behind paywalls or, or whatever. Um, and if you have questions, either now or you're, you're um, mulling this over over the next few days and you think, oh, I wonder what he said, he would have said if I'd asked him this, just shoot us a question. I have a, a, a group of uh, amazing uh, researchers and graduate students uh, that I work with at York, and all we do all day is want to talk about these kinds of questions. So um, if you have a question now, hopefully we can get time to discuss. If you have one next week, next month, whenever, uh, please remember the contact information and get in touch with me because we really want to be that, uh, that, that conduit.